So we know what the conditions are that will be necessary to define an inner product that takes two functions and spits out a scalar that we can use to define the projection of one function onto another function. And it turns out, maybe surprisingly, that there aren't that many ways to define an inner product between two functions um, that will satisfy all three of those properties. And the one that we use is called the L2 inner product and is defined in the following way. The L2 inner product of two functions, f and g, which are both defined on the same interval of the real line. So for now, we're going to call the interval the interval from a to b. So here, the vector space that's in play is the space of all functions whose domain is the closed interval from a to b and whose codomain is the set of real numbers. And the definition of this inner product is the following. So the first thing we need to make sure happens is that we define something which is linear. In other words, if I add functions together, g plus h here, and I do f of g plus h, that, that this should still, this operation should distribute over that addition, maybe is another way to say it, so that the inner product is linear in both of its arguments. So the way to ensure that that happens is to take my two functions and multiply them together f of x times g of x. Because after all, if I then substitute in for g something like, I don't know, g1 plus g2, then the multiplication, sorry, the distributive property of multiplication over addition would guarantee that that will then split apart into the two pieces we would need to satisfy the bilinearity condition. So multiplication is the operation we want to use here between f and g that is going to help guarantee for us some notion of, uh, of linearity. So linearity, I think we can check off. We can also check off symmetry, because multiplication of real numbers, after all, is a commutative operation. So here, f, uh, comma g and g, comma f are going to give us the same result, because multiplication of real numbers is commutative. So condition one and condition two are good. The problem is non-degeneracy. Because if I take this inner product and I get something which is equal to 0, I need to be able to conclude that uh, Sorry, I suppose I need the inner product of something with itself. So let me add that in here as a second line. Let's suppose I take the inner product of something with itself. I'm going to get f of x times f of x, so f of x squared. If this is equal to 0, then I'm supposed to be able to conclude that f is the 0 function. So why can't I do that immediately? What am I missing? Something weird is, is going on up here. And what's weird is that the 0 that I just wrote on the board here is a scalar. Right? This is a, just a plain old single real number. The left-hand side, as it stands right now, is not a scalar. This is a function, f of x times g of x. It could have different values for different x's. Right? Um, so I need to do something which guarantees for us that having a 0 here will make sure that this whole function on the left-hand side is equal to 0. I also want it to be something that will allow us to compare two functions, not at a single x value, but at every single x value on the entire interval from a to b. And the way to make that happen is to aggregate together the values of f of x times g of x over the entire interval from a to b. And that's where our integral comes in. So our definition for this inner product is that the inner product of the function f and the function g is equal to the integral of their product f of x times g of x, over the interval of definition. So here, that interval is the interval from a to b. So that now, it makes a little bit more sense, modulo some fussy questions about what kinds of functions uh, are, are considered here. Let's suppose that these functions are continuous for a moment. If I have a function f, and I know it's continuous, and if its interval, sorry, its integral of f of x squared is equal to 0, what does that tell you about f? Maybe I'll pose the contrapositive. Is it possible to have a function f, which is not the 0 function, and yet when I square it and I integrate it on the interval from a to b, I get 0? Why not? Yeah, I love my leading questions, right? But why no? 
What do we know about f of x squared as a function? What kind of a number is f of x squared guaranteed to be? <clears throat> Greater than or equal to 0. So here I have a function which, for all values of x, is non-negative. But I'm taking its integral. Integral, remember, is the area under the graph of f. So I'm saying that the area under the graph of a non-negative function is equal to 0. So what does that tell me about the function? If we didn't know that this function was non-negative, then some positive area could cancel out some negative area to give us a 0 integral. But if f of x squared, because it's everywhere greater than or equal to 0, the only way to have no area under its graph is for there to be no graph above the x-axis at all. So my point there is that we can conclude that this is true. Again, provided f has some regularity properties. So this is our definition, that to take the inner product of one function with another, we'll multiply the two functions together, and we'll integrate from a to b. And that this operation satisfies every one of the three conditions for being an inner product on the space of functions whose domain of definition is the integral from a to b, and whose codomain is the reals. So if we implement this in our formula at the top of the page, what we're supposed to get out of that is the projection of f of x equals 1 onto f of x equals sine x. And what we'd like for that to be is 4 over pi times sine x. Let's see if it actually works. So to find that out, we need to compute two inner products. The first is the inner product of sine x with itself. So to get that, I'll need to integrate. And here my a and b are 0 and pi because that's the interval that I've chosen here. It's 0 to L if we're, if we're doing it in more generality. And what I'm doing is multiplying sine x times sine x dx. I just need to compute that integral. And this is where you pull out your calc 2 bag of tricks. Um, this is sine squared of x. And we can't integrate sine squared of x directly, so we pull out a trig identity to rewrite it as 1 half minus a half cosine of 2x. And then we can find an antiderivative for that. That's going to give me, I'm going to have to move over to the left here. Antiderivative is going to be x over 2 um, minus 1 fourth sine of 2x evaluated from 0 to pi. And then I think you can convince yourself that when x is 0 and when x is pi, what happens to the sine of 2x? It drops out. And so the only term in this antiderivative that's going to contribute to the, anti, uh, to, to the definite integral is the x over 2. And when I plug x equals pi into this, I get pi over 2. And then I suppose I would be subtracting 0 over 2. But that's transparent. So we conclude that the inner product of sine x with itself is the number pi over 2. So pi over 2 is somehow the magnitude, or rather I should say the squared magnitude, because that's what you get when you take the dot product of a vector with itself, is the squared magnitude of the function sine x on the interval from 0 to pi. So in our projection, of f of x equals 1 onto phi 1 of x is equal to sine x. Our denominator, the dot product of sine x with itself, is pi over 2. To finish our projection, we just then need to find what is the dot product of 1 with sine x to find our numerator. And there again, that's nothing more than the integral, which actually is a little bit of a simpler integral, of the product of sine x with 1. What's an antiderivative for sine x? Negative cosine. Negative cosine of x, evaluated from pi to 0 and subtracted. Uh, so here I'm going to get minus the cosine of pi minus the negative cosine of 0, so plus cosine of 0. Um, what's the cosine of pi? Left side of the unit circle, horizontal 
coordinate? Negative 1. So this is the opposite of negative 1. What's the cosine of 0? 1. So I get minus negative 1 plus 1, 2. Hey, I like doing 1 plus 1 every once in a while. It gives you a break from all these trickier computations. There we go. So 2 is the inner product of sine x and 1. So that becomes our numerator. And then as advertised, if I take 2 and I divide it by pi over 2, I do, in fact, get 4 over pi. So 4 over pi times the sine of x. That is the projection of f of x equals 1 onto phi 1 of x is equal to sine x. It's that multiple of sine x which comes the closest to the function f of x equals 1. If we can figure out how to project onto sine x, then we can also figure out how to project onto sine of 2x, sine of 3x, sine of 8x, 10x, 12x, and so on and so on. And if we project onto more and more sine functions and we add those projections together, then if we have a projection recovery theorem in place, then by the time we've added enough of them together, we should somehow recover our original function back out. And the more of these signs of 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, x that I project onto and then add those projections, and by the way, you can see what's happening with the projection coefficients. They're just becoming, instead of 4 over pi, 4 over 3 pi, 4 over 5 pi, and so on and so on. And the more of them that I add, the better that that sum is going to approximate my little horizontal line segment here, my plucked string. If I somehow can add infinitely many of them together, then what I get is called the Fourier sine series of the function f of x is equal to 1. So I'm just going to close with that terminology and then give you an example to work on your own. So f of x is equal to 1. And what we're finding here is called a Fourier sine series for this function, named after Joseph Fourier, of course, is, according to what we're seeing evolve up here, 4 over pi times sine x plus 4 over 3 pi times the sine of 3x. Notice there's no sine of 2x. Why do you think that is? I'm going to try to write down a general form for this. 2n plus 1 pi times the sine of 2n plus 1 x. I'm using 2n plus 1 here because why? Yeah, I only, I only end up with the odd uh, frequencies that get non-zero projection coefficients. The reason that the other ones drop out is because we get a zero when we take their inner product. If we try it, let's try taking the inner product of 1 with the sine of 2x. That'll be the integral from 0 to pi of 1 times the sine of 2x. What's an antiderivative for sine of 2x? We'll need a cosine and a minus, but then because of a u substitution, we'll also get a factor of 1 half coming out. We'll evaluate that from 0 to pi. But what happens here that's different when I evaluate this from 0 to pi? What's the cosine of 2 pi? One. Cosine of 2 pi, yeah, the cosine of 2 pi is 1. And the cosine of 0, 1. So the two cosines have exactly the same value this time. So I'm going to get negative 1 half times 1 plus 1 half times 1. What's the inner product equal? Zero. Yeah. So what do we call two functions if their inner product is equal to 0? What did we call two vectors when their dot product was 0? Yeah. There we go. So this was a good occasion for the last definition of the day. Two functions are orthogonal if their inner product is equal to 0. So the reason that the Fourier sine series for the function 1 does not have a sine of 2x coefficient, non-zero sine of 2x coefficient, is because that coefficient is 0. That coefficient is 0 because the function 1 and the function sine of 2x are orthogonal on the interval from 0 to pi because their inner product is equal to 0.